Episode 106, Meeting the Family Her mother frowned as she said to Kelly, I don't know why you're becoming so disobedient. Kelly was hurt, but she knew that her mother had only said that because she had seen Alex wearing scruffy clothes. Her family didn't understand that she wanted a boyfriend that she really liked, not just someone with a lot of money. How could you talk back to Grandma like that? Her mother continued. Another relative asked Kelly, How could you bring a boyfriend who dresses so badly home to meet your family? Alice said, Kelly, Grandma dotes on you. You have to be more reasonable. Kelly had been told what to do by her relatives for years. They all had their own perspectives on her life and didn't consider her wishes at all. Some of her relatives started to try to smooth things over. Her uncle said, We shouldn't judge a person by his appearance. Perhaps his family has money, but he just doesn't want to show off. I don't believe that Kelly would do anything to harm the family. He walked up to Alex and said, Alex, right? Where do you live? What does your family do? Witnessing Kelly arguing with her family like this, Alex felt awful. He was contemplating telling them that he was from just inside of the Ambrose family and that they owned Warrior Enterprises. Perhaps this would appease them without him having to reveal his true identity. But before he could say anything, Kelly stepped forward and spoke up for him. He's just an ordinary student from Preston University, and he comes from an ordinary family, she said. As far as she knew, Alex was not even from an averagely wealthy family, but she didn't want him to be mocked by her family anymore. What? One of Kelly's uncles was surprised. He had been expecting Kelly to tell them all that Alex was actually from a much better family than they had all feared, but the reverse was true. He really was a nobody. Margaret heaved a sigh. Kelly really is being so disobedient today, she thought. At that moment, another person's voice came from the driveway. It was saying, This is our villa. Because the courtyard was very quiet, the person's voice could be heard very clearly. The others looked over and saw that it was Simon. He was accompanied by a beautiful girl. To Alex's horror, it was Kathy. Hey, what's going on? Simon asked as he approached. His sister Yvonne rushed over to him and in a whisper told him everything that had happened earlier. Only then did Simon notice that everyone's eyes were focused on Kelly and Alex. The corner of his mouth curled up into a sinister smile. Simon walked over to Alex and said proudly, See so guys did know about my cousin's boyfriend. Let me fill you in. I know all about him. Kelly said quickly, Simon, shut up. She knew that anything he said wasn't going to help. Alex had already made a bad impression on her grandmother and the rest of their family, and she didn't want Simon to make it worse. Don't worry, I won't say any more. I can see that if I do, my cousin's gonna hit me. Simon covered his mouth in mock fear. Speak, Margaret said to Simon. She was becoming increasingly frustrated with Kelly that day. Okay. Simon replied obediently. He looked at his sister. He knew that she was already uncomfortable, but he decided to wind her up a little more. He said provocatively, Remember, Kelly, it's not my fault. Grandma asked me. Even if you're angry, don't hit me. Kelly looked at him with pure hatred in her eyes. This only made him laugh. Simon cleared his throat, then looked at Alex with a wicked grin on his face. He said, He's a poor student from Preston University. He never eats in restaurants, not even once a year. Simon had obtained quite a lot of juicy information from Kathy. He eats the same thing for his breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day. His breakfast is always grits, his lunch is bread, and his dinner is some kind of tinned soup. He only buys two new items of clothes a year. Sometimes he doesn't even have enough money for shampoo, so he just uses detergent to wash his hair. He's been using the same basic cell phone since high school. Even when the screen broke, he didn't have the money to get a new phone. He often takes his girlfriend out to the street vendor for hot dogs because he can't afford to eat out anywhere else. Simon continued on with defamatory information about Alex. No one in Kelly's family could believe what they were hearing or that she would want to date such a person. 
Each time Simon said something new, they would gasp. They couldn't believe that someone could be so poor and live such a basic life. Kathy, who was watching everything, felt very smug when she saw Simon criticizing Alex to the whole Phillips family. She had been sure that Kelly would ditch Alex after what had happened at Simon's party, but here he was. He must have used some kind of trick to change her mind. But now, even if Kelly had fallen for Alex, he didn't stand any chance with her. The Phillipses would definitely not let a poor bastard like him marry into the family, especially after what he had done. Kathy thought that Alex looked extremely pitiful standing in the middle of the crowd, and she laughed at herself. She didn't have a shred of pity for him, and only felt better as she took revenge on him. She thought, Alex, oh Alex, do you really think just because Kelly seems to like you, everything will go smoothly for you now? Margaret's chest rose and fell slightly as she listened to Simon speak. Her face looked sinister and scary, and a silent pressure seemed to emanate from her body. If it had been any family member other than Kelly that she had been glaring at, that person would have been kneeling on the ground at her feet, begging for her forgiveness. I really didn't expect him to be so poor, said one of Simon's cousins. Another replied, He's not even moderately wealthy. What made him think he could be with Kelly? Someone asked, Simon, how do you know him so well? Because his ex-girlfriend is now my girlfriend. Simon smiled proudly toward Kathy, who was obediently walking over to him. He put his arm around her shoulder. Simon introduced her to Margaret. Grandma, her name is Kathy. She's my girlfriend. Hello, Mrs. Phillips. I'm very pleased to meet you, Kathy said sweetly. She's so beautiful, said one of the cousins. Yeah, she looks like a model. Simon's got good taste, agreed another. Several relatives praised Kathy's exquisite looks. Alex was standing beside her, and Kathy knew he must feel extremely uncomfortable. While the Phillips family had criticized and rejected him, they were welcoming her with open arms. This had proved the best way of getting revenge on Alex. Her situation could only improve as part of this family, while his humiliation would grow. Margaret glanced indifferently at Kathy as she asked Simon, You said she was this person's ex-girlfriend? That's right. Simon didn't understand why she was asking, but Kathy did. She became anxious. The others also understood what Margaret meant. One said, She used to be with this guy? If he's a poor loser, then she must be. What does her family do? Are they poor like him? I bet she just wants to marry into our family for the money, concluded another. Someone else advised Simon, It's easy to find a good-looking girl. You really have to worry about her character. Is it just your money she wants? As he listened to the warnings from his family, Simon finally understood the meaning behind his grandmother's words. He hadn't even considered marrying Kathy into his family. All he wanted to do was have a good time with her. He had never expected that dating her would cause such a ruckus. Grandma, actually... He tried to explain the situation to his grandmother, but her gaze suddenly became sharp, as if she was shooting an arrow right through him. Simon was scared. He had to say the right thing now so that he wouldn't lose the love of his grandmother. He said, Grandma, I was careless. Now I understand that if she's the kind of woman who's willing to be with this kind of man, it means that she's no good for me. I haven't known her very long, so I didn't really know what she was like. Don't worry, she'll never be part of our family. Simon became more confident as he spoke. He was sure that his explanation would get him back into his family's good books. Kathy was stunned. Simon? She gasped. She was already uneasy about the situation, but she had never expected Simon to abandon her so decisively. Over the past days, Simon's sweet words had convinced her that he was going to propose and that she was going to be part of a wealthy family as she had always dreamed of. Now his words were like a dagger slashing her beautiful dreams into pieces. Kathy, it's over. We have nothing more to say to each other. Please leave and don't bother me again. Simon said to her resolutely. He was actually quite reluctant to let her go because he wasn't quite bored with her yet. However, his family had made it clear that he had to dump her. Kathy held his hand and pleaded, Simon, you can't treat me like this. You said you wanted to marry me. 
Simon couldn't shake her off no matter how hard he tried. With so many people watching, he felt humiliated that he couldn't even handle a single woman. Get lost! Simon kicked Kathy to the ground. He yelled at her. Don't blame me for this. If you have to blame anyone, blame yourself for being so beautiful. Of course, men want to sleep with you. Since I've had some fun with you, I'm going to compensate you with $20,000. Take this card. The pin is 4624. Now hurry up and get out of my sight. Simon took out a bank card from his wallet and threw it on the ground. Kathy knew there was no hope. If she stayed, she would only have to endure further humiliation. She stood up, picked up the card from the ground, turned around and ran out of the courtyard through the fancy iron gate. Grandma, I was wrong. Please accept my apology. Simon lowered his head and walked over to Margaret. It's good to know you've admitted your mistakes. Everything will be okay now, Margaret told him kindly. Simon nodded and stood to the side. He was relieved. Kelly, what about you? Margaret's gaze once again landed on Kelly. She hoped that she would admit her mistakes like Simon did. As long as she did, Margaret would forgive her too. Kelly didn't dare to meet her grandmother's eyes, but she still said in a low voice, I'm sorry, grandmother. She didn't want to give up Alex because of her family. Margaret's body started to tremble. Kelly kept disobeying her, and she was getting really angry. A few people quickly rushed over to support her, but she pushed them away. That moment, Simon walked over to Alex and shoved him. He said angrily, Just get lost. How dare you upset my grandmother like this, stupid loser. Alex's body felt weak and he almost fell to the ground. Why are you pushing him? Leave him alone, Kelly scolded Simon. She hugged Alex, asking with concern, Are you okay? Why are you protecting him? One of Kelly's cousins asked her. An aunt said, Now you've really upset Grandma. You should show some more respect, said another. Kelly's family was really unhappy with her. She knew that if she stayed, her relatives would continue to berate her, so she decided to leave with Alex. She said, Grandmother, I understand that you don't like him very much. Since you're so upset with us, we'll leave now. Kelly supported Alex as they walked towards the fancy metal gate. Stop! Margaret bellowed. You came here for a family gathering, and now you think you can leave so soon? If you leave now, you are no longer part of our family. If it was anyone else, Margaret wouldn't care so much. But Kelly was too important to her to let her go. She knew that she had to do something to shock her into staying. Episode 107, New Wheels Kelly gritted her teeth and stopped walking. Alex coughed a few times, and Kelly patted his back. He's obviously also a sickly person, commented one of her uncles. I really can't figure it out. Just what does she see in him? Asked his wife. Her husband agreed. Judging from the look of him, I know he won't live for much longer. It's time to eat, Margaret said as she looked at Kelly angrily and walked away. The servants had started to remove the reclining chairs and to bring out wine and snacks. They had placed three long dining tables in the courtyard. The family members sat down in their usual places. The Phillips men had also returned from their fishing trip in the Purple Dawn Lake. They included Kelly's father, Hamilton, and Simon's father, Walter. From the outside, it looked like they were talking and laughing together. But in reality, they were secretly competing for power within the Phillips family. Hamilton walked up to his wife, Alice, and daughter, Kelly. He noticed Alex, but it didn't cross his mind that he was anything to do with his family. As in the previous two years... Kelly's family walked toward the seats closest to Margaret's. Hamilton went to sit down with his wife and daughters. Mom, he greeted Margaret, but she didn't respond. She seemed to be upset. Don't be in such a hurry to sit down, Margaret said coldly, without even looking at him. Oh, okay. Hamilton's backside had nearly touched the chair when he awkwardly laughed and stood up once more. We have guests here today. Why don't you take a seat at the end of the table? Margaret said with a stern expression before glancing at Yvonne and Brian, 
were seated at the fourth and fifth seats to her right. Yvonne, you and Brian come and sit here. Yes, Grandma, Yvonne replied sweetly. Holding Brian's arm, she happily walked to Hamilton's seat and coughed lightly, saying, Uncle, please, could you move so we can sit down? Hamilton was perplexed. Trying to retrain a shred of dignity, he smiled and made way for his niece and her boyfriend to take their seats. Hamilton, Alice, and Kelly all headed toward their seats further down the table. It was only now that he noticed that the scruffy boy who didn't seem to belong was always next to Kelly. He asked his wife who the stranger was. When Alice told her, he looked angrily at Kelly. He wanted to ask her to immediately admit her mistake to her grandmother and to quickly get rid of Alex so that they could retain their respected status within the family. However, by that time, the servants had laid the tables, and he didn't dare to lose his temper with Kelly as the meal was about to start. He would have to wait until they got home before sorting it out. Seeing that the people sitting on either side of Margaret were all from Walter's family, and that she seemed to be very satisfied with Yvonne's boyfriend, he felt even more upset with his daughter. I'm sorry about my family, Kelly whispered to Alex. She regretted begging him to come to the family reunion with her. Looking at his pale face, she was very worried. Is your throat sore? Not too bad, but I could do with some hot water, Alex replied. He didn't blame Kelly at all, but he did feel an itch in his throat. Kelly immediately waved toward a servant and asked her, Please, pour me a cup of hot water. The servant agreed and was about to go get Kelly some water when Margaret stopped her. You can do it yourself, she said coldly to Kelly. Then she turned away and continued chatting with Walter and his family. Kelly looked at her grandmother with resentment. Then she was pained when she remembered how her grandmother had helped her before. She said to Alex, Come on, we'll go to the house to get you a drink. Grandma also has tea leaves, so I'll make you some tea. That'll help you feel better. As she spoke, she helped Alex up, and they were about to head to the house for a drink. They were stopped by Hamilton, who said in a solemn voice, Kelly, sit down. The anger in his voice made Alex's heart tremble. He didn't want Kelly to be in trouble with her family, so he said softly, I'll go by myself. It's okay. You don't know where everything is. I'll go with you, Kelly replied, acting as if she had not heard her father's words. She had decided that she no longer cared if her entire family turned against her. In fact, she wanted them to see that she wasn't afraid to stand up to them. With everyone watching, Kelly supported Alex as they slowly walked into the house. Margaret didn't appear to care that they were defying the family, but as Kelly walked past her, she shook her head and sighed softly. Damn, Margaret said to herself, trying to get a better understanding of her family's situation. Walter and his wife Elizabeth were quietly listening. Only Yvonne seemed unaffected as she continued playing with her cell phone. Suddenly she opened her eyes wide and shouted excitedly, Oh, wow! This girl, Margaret said with a smile. She was very impressed with Brian, and she was also very fond of Yvonne. She patted the back of Brian's hand gently and said, Don't mind me, Brian. This girl is always excited about something or other. Who, me, Grandma? Yvonne smiled as she pouted at her grandmother. She put her phone on the table and said to her family, Look at this. Aren't you all shocked? Mr. Catullo, the president of the Ferrari Corporation of Italy, is in America. Brian picked up her phone and read it out to everyone. The news was that the president of Ferrari in Italy had come to America in person to deliver the world's most expensive brand new Ferrari to a mysterious buyer. The car was worth over $2 million. Brian calmly told everyone, This is interesting news. Ferrari was founded in 1929 by Enzo Ferrari, a world-famous manufacturer of Formula One cars. Ferrari's cars are handmade and very few are produced. As of 2018, a total of only 14,628 new cars have been made. Margaret's eyes lit up as she watched Brian and thought, To know so much about one particular news story, this young man clearly has an impressive depth and range of knowledge. Walter and Elizabeth both smiled at Brian with satisfaction. Walter said, Brian, you seem to know Ferrari quite well. Brian replied casually, 
You flatter me, Mr. Phillips. Actually, I bought a Ferrari not long ago, and at that time I did a lot of research into the company. Hearing that Brian owned a Ferrari, Walter was pleasantly surprised. He rubbed his hands as he contemplated the possibility of taking it for a spin. He said, What? You drive a Ferrari? Why didn't I see it when I arrived? How did I miss it? Brian replied humbly, Oh, you didn't see it because I didn't drive it here today. If you'd like to try it out, I can get someone to drive it over here. He was determined to make a good impression on the Phillips family and lay a solid foundation for his marriage to Yvonne. He had planned to keep his Ferrari as a backup plan, but since the topic had come up, he decided to use it now to impress his future in-laws. Walter replied excitedly, Can you? I'd really appreciate it if you can get someone to drive your car over here. I would love to try it out and find out what it feels like to drive the world's best luxury car. Walter was very proud of his future son-in-law and wanted him to bring the car over to show off in front of the rest of the family. No one else in their family owned a Ferrari. Okay, Brian agreed. He immediately called a member of his staff and told him to bring his car over. Margaret watched Brian and quietly nodded her head. A satisfied smile appeared on her face. A few minutes later, the servants started to bring out the plates of food and placed them in the middle of the long table for everyone to help themselves. Kelly accompanied Alex back to the table, carrying a cup of tea for him. He had drunk some hot water in the house and was feeling much better. They walked to their seats and sat down. Everyone started their meal and chatted as they ate. Alex realized that he was a little hungry and helped himself to some vegetables and salad. But just as he was putting the salad onto his plate, he noticed that the man sitting opposite him was staring at him in disgust and muttering obscenities to himself. The man said to him, Aren't you afraid about infecting the rest of us if you're sick? You're so thoughtless. His wife agreed. I certainly won't be eating from any of the dishes that this sickly boy's touched. I don't want to catch anything. Kelly was annoyed when she heard them discussing Alex in such a derogatory manner. However, she already knew that none of her family liked him, so it didn't seem worth getting angry with these two in particular. Don't worry about them, she said to Alex. Tell me what you want to eat and I'll serve you. She continued in a whisper as she spooned some stew onto his plate. The meal went on without incident, and the family members continued to chat happily amongst themselves. Halfway through the meal, Alex's phone rang. Everyone watched him with contempt as he pulled out his cell phone. It was such a cheap brand that they all concluded that he must be a complete loser, and their opinions of him sank even lower. Of course, they all had the latest expensive models. Alex looked at the number on his phone. It was the manager of the New York Auto Exhibition Center. It must be news about my new Ferrari, he thought as he answered the phone. Hello, Mr. Ambrose, the caller said excitedly. I've kept you waiting for a long time, but I'm pleased to say that the new super luxurious Ferrari that you ordered has now been delivered to New York. Where are you now? I'll bring it to you. Alex was surprised. He answered, The car is here in New York? But I still have half the money to pay, don't I? Wait a moment. I'll call the manager at the Metro Sky Bank and get him to transfer the rest of the $2 million to you. The manager replied, Oh, didn't you know? The payment has already been taken care of. It turned out that while Alex had been recuperating at the Azalea Guest House and had been completely focused on Debbie's disappearance, Ken Stokes had taken a call from the Ferrari company asking for the rest of the money and had settled it for him. Oh, that's brilliant, Alex replied happily. Right now I'm at the Western Villa in the southwest corner of Purple Dawn Lake. It's easy to find. Please, get it sent here. Yes, Mr. Ambrose. It'll be there shortly. We'll deliver it to you right now. The manager agreed respectfully and ended the call. Alex put his phone away and realized that everyone was looking at him curiously. Simon rubbed his chin and asked him with a smile, Alex, what were you just talking about that was worth two million dollars? What's going on? Tell us about it. It's nothing really. I just bought a car. Alex replied and started eating a salad. 
there was a moment of silence at the table before everyone in the family burst into laughter. Episode 108, We Don't Believe You <laughs> you're awesome, laughed Simon sarcastically as he gave Alex a thumbs up. I'd like to ask which car you're buying for two million, or is that only half the total cost? Why don't you tell us? That's right, tell us all, laughed Walter. Simon continued, four million? I don't know there was such an expensive car in the entire country. Walter scoffed at Alex. You're apparently so rich and yet you're still coming to our house to eat our food? The rest of Kelly's family started to jeer as well, but Alex ignored them and continued to eat. He felt no obligation to explain himself to them. A few minutes later, Margaret spoke up. She said, Alex, you can't just keep eating and ignoring us. I was under the impression that you want to date my granddaughter and so get into our good books. Since you bought a car, why can't you tell us about it? She looked at him sternly. She believed that his answer was sure to demonstrate to Kelly for once and for all what a loser this man was. Alex didn't answer. He had guessed exactly what Margaret was trying to do. He was actually very unimpressed with the Phillips family and didn't care at all what they thought of him. Margaret and her family interrupted Alex's attitude as contempt and a lack of respect. Kelly knew her grandmother and understood that Alex's approach was making her furious. No matter what car Alex had bought, it was best to just be honest about it, or the situation would get worse. She tried to settle things. Alex, you and Grandma... Suddenly, there was a loud thud. Margaret had slammed her fist on the table, startling everyone. Kelly, take a look at this man you insist on defending, she said angrily. Then she turned her gaze to Alex and said, If you can't even be bothered to tell us, then leave. Go on, you're not welcome here. Alex slowly put down his cutlery and met Margaret's gaze. He could see the burning anger in her eyes, but he remained calm. It's a Ferrari. I bought a Ferrari, Alex said. Margaret's expression became more furious. She glared at Alex and her hands clenched into fists on the table. He obviously couldn't afford a Ferrari so now he was just trying to make fools of them. Alex, how much did you pay for the Ferrari? Brian asked as he looked at him. He knew that everyone was angry with Alex, especially Margaret, and he realized that if he could help them embarrass Alex or help them chase him off, he would win the respect of everyone in the family. This Alex was a thick-skinned thug, and Brian had his way of dealing with thugs. Over two million... Alex replied, looking at him. Oh, Brian was surprised. He had not expected Alex to be able to lie so masterfully without showing any signs of panic. He seemed to be an expert liar. No wonder Kelly had been fooled by him. He continued to question Alex about the car. So what kind of Ferrari did you order? How much did you have to pay in advance? What's its top speed? How many seconds for it to go from zero to 60? Having bought his own Ferrari... Brian knew what was involved. He was sure that he could catch Alex out by asking these questions that he wouldn't be able to answer. Alex frowned and looked at Brian. He said, What? Why are you asking me all these questions? When I bought the car, it was very simple. I just asked them to manufacture it to the highest standards possible and using the most advanced technology available. He only managed to evoke more contempt and loathing from those around him. They couldn't believe that he would lie so outrageously. Brian clapped his hands toward him and said, I'm asking you all the same detailed questions that the Ferrari company asks any customer who wants to order a car. If you can't answer the questions, it means you clearly haven't actually ordered a car from them. Although I have to admit that your answer is very clever that you asked them to do it according to the best standards. Of course, that would make all the other questions unnecessary. It sounded like praise for Alex, but everyone could hear the irony in Brian's words. Simon said disapprovingly, You want us to believe that not only have you bought a Ferrari, but also that you ask them to give you the highest spec available? If you have that much money, I suggest that you buy yourself a decent set of clothes first. 
Brian said with a chuckle. Hey, Simon, maybe Alex really does own several hundred million dollars. Maybe he keeps them all in the Metro Skybank. Another round of laughter arose in the garden. Yeah, that's right, he's a billionaire. Maybe he actually lives in the Metro Skybank. Simon was laughing so hard that his stomach hurt. He gave Brian a thumbs up and said, Buddy, he's finished. Alex frowned and started to breathe heavily. Alex, Kelly said softly. She felt that Brian and her family had gone too far. Alex adjusted his mood and smiled at Kelly. It's all right, he reassured her. Since these people were treating him with animosity, he decided to get his own back. He grabbed Kelly's hand, thinking to himself, Are you all just going to let me grab her and not say anything? Aren't you all afraid that a poor loser like me is going to bite Kelly? I'm interested to see what you'll do. Kelly blushed when he took her hand, as her worry for him quickly turned into warmth and surprise. When Margaret saw them, she wanted to kill Alex there and then. Brian stood up and walked over to them, saying, All right, since you said you ordered a Ferrari for two million, then I'll ask you the simplest question. When did you order your car? With a smile, he continued, If you can't even tell us that, then please, show some dignity and leave. Otherwise, I don't mind helping you find your way out. Brian is ex-military, so kicking out this trash will be no problem for him. Yvonne took the opportunity to shout. Why are you... Kelly wanted to fight for Alex, but he pulled her back and smiled confidently. It's fine, he said. Facing Brian's ultimatum, Alex didn't show the slightest hint of fear. He looked even more relaxed than Brian. Less than two months ago, he said in answer to Brian's question. Hearing his reply, Brian laughed contemptuously. Ha <laughs> ha! He laughed as he looked at Alex with eyes full of disdain. How much longer do you want to keep up this pretense? I know for a fact that it takes at least three months to get a car from Ferrari. If you don't believe me, you can check it out on your own. And you told us that you've ordered the Ferrari supercar, which uses the most advanced technology and to the highest standards? How could that be manufactured in less than three months? Come on, explain that to everyone. If you can't, then there's nothing else to say. And you can please...
Episode 109, Has the World Gone Crazy? Are you for real? Simon said as everyone stood up from their seats. Some of them walked to the gate and looked at the car. It's really a Ferrari, Walter confirmed as the blue car pulled up to the gate. Could it be that what he said is true? Someone asked. Is this really a Ferrari? Is he really from a rich family? Said another aunt. The family members were shocked and confused. Then Yvonne said loudly to everyone, Stop being idiots! This is Brian's Ferrari! They all finally understood and felt even more respect for Brian. One of them said, Like I said, it can't be this kid's car. He's just making it up. How would someone like him ever buy a Ferrari? Another agreed, Yvonne's boyfriend is awesome. He's only in his 20s and he's already driving a Ferrari. That's right, he's handsome, knowledgeable, and rich. Our family will really benefit from him marrying Yvonne, said his wife. Everyone, this is my Ferrari. Would you like to come and take a look? Brian politely asked Yvonne's family. Margaret, Yvonne, Walter, and Elizabeth walked together out of the fancy iron gate and over to the car. Brian's driver got out of the car and handed the key to him. I ordered this car a year ago and it was delivered six months ago. I paid a total of half a million dollars. During the manufacturing process, I made a lot of specific requests, resulting in the car you see before you. I've asked Ferrari about my car, and they told me that because of its specifications, it's in the top 30% of the vehicles sold by the entire Ferrari company. Brian stood up and presented his beloved car to Margaret and the others. Then he waved the key in his hand and said, I'll show you now. Brian pressed the key and watched in satisfaction as the two sides of the car slowly rose. At the same time, the roof and the rear door also slowly lifted. After what seemed like a scene from a science fiction movie, the roof was hidden in the back, and the two sides of the doors remained in the air like wings. The sapphire blue Ferrari was extremely beautiful. It emanated a feeling of luxury and futuristic technology causing all of the surrounding family members to gasp in admiration. Mr. Phillips, didn't you want to try it out? Please go ahead, Brian gestured to Walter. No, no, he replied. You youngsters are much better drivers. I was just spouting nonsense. He was itching to have a go, but he was also afraid of the consequences if he accidentally damaged it. Yvonne, let Brian take you for a drive around Purple Dawn Lake, he continued as he pushed his daughter toward the car. Great idea. Go on, Yvonne, get in the car, Elizabeth said, feeling excited for her daughter. Yvonne, let's go. Why aren't you getting in the car? Asked Brian. Yvonne smiled sweetly and climbed in. She didn't usually get to spend much time alone with Brian, and this was her first time sitting in a Ferrari, so she was very excited. Brian was about to get into his car when he caught a glimpse of Kelly and Alex still sitting at the table in the courtyard. He called out to Alex, Hey buddy, I'm going to take a spin around Purple Dawn Lake. I hope I'll get to see your two million Ferrari when I get back. With a parting wave to Margaret, Brian drove the Ferrari toward the lake. Watching the car drive away with four flames coming out of the exhaust cylinders, everyone was impressed. When they returned to the courtyard, they once again began to mock and ridicule Alex. They said that Brian was the perfect boyfriend, while he was just a clown with a big mouth. Simon stared at him and said to Margaret, Grandma, how about I get someone to kick this kid out of here already? Margaret turned to Kelly and said sarcastically, Didn't he say that someone was sending him a Ferrari worth two million? How can we afford to offend such a wealthy and noble person? The others were talking about how shameless Alex was, yelling at him from time to time and trying to get him to leave while praising Brian. Alex, maybe you should just leave, Kelly whispered to him. She believed that he had made up the story about his new car because he was angry. I'm not lying, someone will bring me the car, he replied with a bland expression. Kelly sighed softly and was quiet. Sharon glared at Alex and said, Yes, of course we believe that someone's going to send you a luxury Ferrari. Don't you think you've embarrassed Kelly enough for one day? Why don't you shut up or leave? Half an hour later, more headlights appeared. Kelly's uncle stood up from his seat and looked at the door. 
he saw a big vehicle with flashing blue and white lights. It looks like an armored security vehicle, he told the others. Really? Someone replied. This truck is huge, much larger than the security vehicles at the bank. Everyone was wondering what a security vehicle was doing there. The Purple Dawn Lake was a long way from the city, and the armored vehicles were usually used to carry money and other things of extreme value within the city. They were all thinking, it's so remote here and it's not a major road. Strange, an armored truck should show up here. What surprised them even more was that the security vehicle was heading directly toward their villa. When it stopped in front of the iron gate, two heavily armed men jumped down from the cab. In their hands, they were holding machine guns. They stood on either side of the truck, guarding it. Watching from the courtyard, the Phillips family were terrified. They thought that someone in the family must have done something criminal. As the head of the family, Margaret opened the iron gate and walked out. The rest of the family hid behind her, watching the men. Then everyone noticed a black Fiat pulling up behind the security truck. The Fiat stopped and the doors opened. Two men and a woman stepped out and walked quickly toward the courtyard. What's going on? Everyone wondered. Judging from their appearances, these are clearly respectable people. Are they here to visit the family? Hello, may I ask who you are? Margaret quickly went up to greet them, but she didn't recognize any of them. She asked them, Is this security vehicle something to do with you? Hello, said one of the men as he shook hands with Margaret. He didn't introduce himself or his companions or pay her much attention. He was clearly looking for someone in the crowd. Family members looked at each other confused. Mr. Sharp, it's an honor to meet you. Hello, Simon said as he stepped forward. He often walked around the New York Auto Exhibition Center and he recognized the manager, Harold Sharp. He extended his hand toward Harold, who shook it distractedly, but he still seemed to be searching the crowd. Gramner, this is Mr. Sharp. He's the manager of New York Auto Exhibition Center, Simon explained to Margaret. 80% of New York's luxury cars are sold by Harold Sharp. In the upper echelons of New York society, he's definitely one of the people that everyone wants to get to know. Everyone was interested in meeting Mr. Sharp, but none of them dared to disturb him as it was clear from his sharp gaze that he was searching for someone. The woman who accompanied Harold whispered something to him. Wait a moment, he said to his companions. Then he looked at the family and said loudly, Mr. Ambrose, are you here? Margaret said to him, Mr. Ambrose? Mr. Sharp, you're mistaken. This is a family gathering of the Phillips family. There's no one here called Mr. Ambrose. Everyone nodded in agreement. They didn't even think about Alex, because he could clearly not have any involvement with anyone as impressive as these strangers. The family members shut the iron gate, so that Mr. Sharp couldn't see into the courtyard. He shouted twice, but no one responded. Strange, I'll check that this is definitely the correct address, he said as he took out his phone and pressed the call button. He put the phone to his ear, looking a little anxious. His companions understood that he was calling Mr. Ambrose and remained silent. As he waited, he heard the sound of a phone's ringtone coming from the garden. He was surprised as he recognized it as a cheap model. The family members in the courtyard heard Alex's phone ringing and cursed him again. They didn't for a moment think it was Mr. Sharp calling him. However, Mr. Sharp and his companions were happy when they heard the phone ringing, and they followed the sound to the courtyard. Yvonne's family was astonished as they realized what was happening. They followed the strangers into the courtyard. Harold had an expression of pure joy when he recognized Alex sitting at the table. When he had met him at the New York Auto Exhibition Center and Alex had transferred over a million dollars to the car shop's account, he had made a conscious effort to etch Alex's appearance into his mind so that he would recognize him in the future. Mr. Ambrose he said as he quickly walked over to Alex. His companions followed. Surprised, Kelly helped Alex stand up and they both turned around. When the family members looked at Alex again, understanding slowly started to dawn on them. 
they realized that he wasn't the lowlife that they thought he was. Hello, Mr. Ambrose. Mr. Sharp smiled ingratiatingly as he held Alex's hand with both of his own. He introduced him to one of his companions. This is Mr. Catullo, the president of the Ferrari company. He's come to America specifically to meet you. Hello, Alex said as he looked at the man. Catullo took the initiative to reach out and they shook hands. He said something in Italian with a smile on his face. Alex assumed that he was thanking him for his trust in Ferrari and expressing his desire to have the opportunity to serve him again. Watching the scene, almost everyone in the Phillips family was shocked. They were dumbstruck as what they were seeing went completely against their knowledge of Alex. They were all thinking, is Alex really the Mr. Ambrose that this gentleman is looking for? Did this loser really buy a Ferrari? And has Ferrari CEO really come to America personally to deliver a car for him? Are we crazy or is that the world has gone crazy? Kelly was also extremely shocked. She looked at Alex with her eyes wide open and her mind went blank. She suddenly felt that she didn't know him at all. The true Alex was a mystery to her. You're too kind. Alex smiled humbly and nodded toward Mr. Catullo. Then he looked at Harold and asked, Have you brought my car? It's here. It's right outside. Mr. Ambrose, please. Harold replied as gestured toward the gate. The family all stepped back to make way for Alex to walk past them toward the gate. Episode 110. Welcome to the family. Mr. Ambrose, your car is right here. After finding out that Mr. Cthulhu was planning to deliver it to you personally, the Ferrari managers in New York also wanted to ensure that it would reach you safely. Mr. Cthulhu hired an armored truck to transport your car to ensure that it didn't get damaged. Thank you. Alex smiled at Mr. Cthulhu. Mr. Ambrose, I'll get the car down for you now, Harold said, and he signaled to two heavily armed men who were standing beside the armored transport vehicle. The two men still carrying their machine guns, went to the back of the truck and used their keys to open the lock. They opened the door and lowered a ramp, allowing Harold to slowly drive out the car that was stored inside. It was a white Ferrari. Just its appearance and shape alone were more stunning than Brian's. Harold stepped out of the car saying, Mr. Ambrose, this is the car you ordered. It's also the most valuable car ever sold by Ferrari. Let me introduce this car to you. He pressed the car's key fob and all the lights lit up. Some were blue and some were gold. The car door and trunk started moving at the same time. It didn't look like a car, but a futuristic transformer. Harold told Alex, Your car was designed by the top ten designers and engineers in our company. It's different from any other car we've ever manufactured in the past. It really is unique. According to your specifications, all the parts and components of this car are of the highest quality in the industry. For the tires, for example, we communicated with the executives of Michelin and had them use only the very best cutting-edge technology. He continued, Of course, this car of yours is not just a simple car. It can drive up to a depth of six feet underwater without admitting a drop of water, whilst maintaining the same functionality as it has on land. There is also every possibility that you could fly across the Hudson River in it. For most cars, this would be extremely challenging. But because of the unique body design of this car, it should be possible. It has the highest level safety features available across the world, on par with those of the President's cars, he said proudly. This car incorporates the most advanced technologies in the world. For instance, the air circulation, surround sound technology, ergonomic seats, bulletproof glass. Harold continued to introduce the car to Alex. Even though he had come into contact with so many luxury cars, he still couldn't help but be obsessed with this car. Listening to Harold's introduction, the Phillips family were captivated. Their gazes never left the luxurious Ferrari that was parked in front of them. They felt honored just to have this amazing car parked by their villa. Harold continued, 
Mr. Ambrose, this car has the most advanced artificial intelligence technology. Please enter your fingerprints on the car keys, and you will officially become its exclusive owner. He respectfully handed the car keys to Alex, and under his guidance, Alex recorded his fingerprints. The family cheered. They had quickly forgotten how badly they had previously treated Alex when they thought he was a nobody. Now, in their eyes, he was the owner of the luxurious car and such an important person that even the president of the Ferrari Empire treated him with respect. Now, they looked up to him. Kelly was also congratulating Alex. There was no shock in her eyes, only pride. She hadn't made a mistake, and now she knew that she had chosen a man who could give her a life of luxury. He possessed so much wealth, yet he was so calm and humble. Mr. Sharp, can this car record other people's fingerprints? Alex asked. No, this is your exclusive car and we can only record your fingerprints, Harold said apologetically. I assume that you want to allow others to drive your car? That's no problem. It has also been built into the design. Although others can't record their fingerprints, they can use the voice recognition. The technology is slightly less advanced than the fingerprint security, but as long as they have the car keys, they will be able to drive this car. Good, Alex nodded in satisfaction. He held Kelly's hand and said to Harold, Please help me record her voice now. Kelly was a little dazed. Alex was giving her the right to drive his $2 million sports car. Her family members were also moved. It was at this moment that they realized what an outstanding boyfriend Kelly had found. Of course, Harold agreed. He went to Kelly, raised a small microphone toward her, and said, Miss, I need to record a sample of your voice. Please say a few words. Anything that comes into your head. She looked at Alex, who was also looking at her. She realized that Alex was so handsome that she couldn't help but fall in love with him. She mumbled, Alex is my perfect man. He's honest, dignified, and generous. Alex's expression froze, and he turned his face away. Miss, please say a few more words. We need to record a little more, said Harold as he looked at the apparatus to record Kelly's voice. Looking at Alex, Kelly asked him with a voice full of emotion. Alex, I like you. Do you want to be with me? Alex didn't respond. Harold said happily, All right, your voice has been recorded. From now on, as long as you have keys to this car on you, you'll be able to drive it. Then he turned to Alex and said, Mr. Ambrose, do you want to try it out now? Okay, Alex responded. He lowered his body and sat in the driver's seat of the Ferrari. He glanced at Kelly and asked, Do you want to try it with me? Kelly smiled sweetly and climbed into the passenger seat. The Ferrari door closed slowly. Alex started the car, and just from the sound of the engine... Everyone could tell it was a very high-end car. As Alex slowly drove the car away, the four exhaust cylinders at the back threw out four flames. This was much more impressive than Brian's car earlier, and everyone exclaimed in admiration. By the time the flames had disappeared, the Ferrari was already a hundred yards away. The family had now accepted the fact that Alex was wealthy. They felt ashamed when they remembered how they had mocked him, and if they could turn back the clock to when they first met him, they would have treated him with far more respect. Hope you are enjoying our Insta Millionaire story. Download the Pocket FM app for more stories. Link in description. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to never miss our new stories. Although Margaret looked calm, inside she was full of anxiety. She couldn't stop thinking that perhaps she should admit her mistakes to her granddaughter and apologize to Alex. Alex drove the car to Purple Dawn Lake. He turned to Kelly and asked, How are you feeling? He opened the roof of the car, letting in a gentle breeze. It all felt so perfect. Wonderful, replied Kelly as her hair danced in the wind. I had no idea that you were so rich. Now, can you tell me who you really are? I imagine that you already know that there aren't too many people in America with the surname Ambrose who can afford to buy a Ferrari. 
Alex replied. You're from the world-famous Ambrose family? Kelly asked with a slightly trembling voice. Indeed, just as Alex said, she knew that there was only one person in America named Ambrose who could afford to spend two million on a car. She asked, I... do I still have a chance with you? Kelly started to feel anxious. She knew that there was no way that the Phillips family could match the Ambrose family. Alex thought carefully. He said, You must be prepared for my family to object to me being with you, just as your family previously objected to you being with me. In fact, the strength of my family's objection will be even greater. He was being dishonest. The fact was that Alex would marry whoever he wanted, and they would become part of the Ambrose family. The truth was that he already had Debbie in his heart. He didn't want to be with anyone else. Alex coming from the Ambrose family changed everything. Within important families, marriage was all about status, and Kelly knew that his family would never accept him marrying someone like her from a small New York family. After driving around to Purple Dawn Lake for a while, Alex turned the car around and they headed back toward the villa. When they were still 200 yards away, they saw Brian slowly approaching the gate of the villa in his own Ferrari. A sinister smile appeared on Alex's face. As Brian drove slowly toward the villa, he saw that the whole of the Phillips family appeared to be standing at the entrance waiting for him. He smiled to himself smugly as he opened the car door. He was about to climb out of the car when a dazzling beam of light blinded him, followed by a loud bang, causing the car to shake violently. When Brian opened his eyes, he saw that the car door had been crushed. He was livid that his half a million dollar Ferrari had been damaged. He jumped out of the car to find out who had hit him, only to discover that the car that hit him was not only another Ferrari, but a much more expensive one than his own. The other Ferrari reversed slowly into Brian's car, and only then did Brian realize that the person driving the other car was Alex. Does he have a Ferrari? Brian asked himself in complete shock. Suddenly, Brian heard a roaring sound. Alex had turned his car around and let the four exhaust cylinders spray fire at Brian's car first at the car's rear, then at the car's side, and then at the front of the car. No matter how loudly Brian and Yvonne shouted and pleaded, Alex refused to stop. By the time Alex had finished with Brian's car, it was unrecognizable. Black and crushed, it looked like a pile of scrap metal. As Alex and Kelly climbed out of their car, Brian rushed over. He was boiling with rage and looking like he wanted to kill Alex. Harold quickly ordered the two security guards to intervene. They rushed over, pointing their machine guns at Brian and shouting, Don't move! Brian was so scared that he immediately backed off, covering his head with his hands, afraid of being shot. Alex turned to Harold and said, Mr. Sharp, please talk to the manager at Sky Metro Bank and ask him to compensate Brian for his car. Of course, he replied. He looked at Brian and said, Sir, please calm down. I'm the manager of the New York Auto Exhibition Center, and this is Mr. Catullo, the president of Ferrari. We will ensure that you are compensated for your loss. Brian's mind was in complete disarray. He thought to himself, Mr. Sharp of the New York Auto Exhibition Center? Mr. Catullo, the president of Ferrari? Why are they here? And why are they taking orders from Alex? The Phillips family all gathered round Alex. They were trying to ingratiate themselves to him, but he completely ignored them. He said loudly to Kelly, I know that your family doesn't want me here. A wave of denials emanated from various members of the Phillips family, but again Alex ignored them. He continued, For this reason, I think it's better if I just leave. Have a good life. He shouted as he climbed into the Ferrari.